welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna keep keep going today with uh, more practice with stoichiometry and uh, do a bunch of practice problems with uh, and those vocabulary terms, limiting reactant, excess reactant, and things like that. And then we're gonna get into um, how we can how we can predict the products of precipitation reactions. And we'll get some more practice with uh, concentration and we'll keep, keep working on theoretical yield and, and all of those um, concepts until you guys are feeling pretty confident with it. <clears throat> um, so let's go ahead and we'll, we will review the, those uh, specific um, vocab terms that are not the, the trickiest part about them is remembering how to apply the logic and, and sort of the um, idea of what's being made and what's running out as these reactions are happening. Um, so remember that uh, limiting reactant is always the reactant that runs out first, not always what you have least of. So, and there's a couple ways we can show we can show our work for these problems. Um, if we want to show limiting reactant for this problem, um, one of the ways we can do this is we can say, okay, if I use up all of my iron. How much oxygen would that take? And then we look at the number of the amount of oxygen that would require, and we compare that to how much oxygen we have. So for instance, if we said, okay, I've got 2.0 moles of iron. And every time I use four moles of iron, that's three moles of oxygen used. So when we do that, hmm. we again, we have to be in moles for this to work. But if we do that, we can say, OK, 2 divided by 4 times 3 and get 1.5. moles of oxygen used. So now we just need to think about this in as far as um, in, a, in a logical way. If using up all of our iron requires 1.5 moles of oxygen, we don't actually have that, right? We only have one mole of oxygen. So using up all of our iron would requires more oxygen than we have. So if that's the case, that means that the oxygen must be running out first. To make an analogy, we have enough patties to make 75 hamburgers, but we only have enough buns to make 50 hamburgers. Or maybe rephrase that. We have enough patties to use up 75 buns, but we only have 50 buns. Therefore, we must be running out of the buns first. Right, and so when we do this, there's, there's only really, there's three options, right? Either we get a number that's more than what we have to start with, or we get a number that's less than what we have to start with. If I <clears throat> started with the oxygen, if I said, okay, 1.0 moles of oxygen, And every time I use three moles of oxygen, that's four moles of iron used. We do that, we get 1.3 moles of iron used. This is really telling us the same thing. It's the saying, if I use up all of my oxygen, 
I'm using, I'm going to use 1.3 moles of iron and I started with two moles of iron. If I'm using less iron than I have, then that means the oxygen must be running out first. These, both of these lines, the red and the blue, are both telling us the same thing. They're both telling us that oxygen is running out first. <clears throat> um, so in both of, both of these, and these two approaches should always agree. If you're talking about the same system, doesn't matter which of these options you use, if you're consistent, they'll both tell you the same molecule as your limiting reactant. So that allows us to say oxygen is the limiting reactant. Right. To give you one more tool to be able to calculate limiting reactant, um, this is just another way of thinking about the logic here. So it's going to give us the same answer, just showing our work a different way. We can take both of these two amounts and say, OK, if I use up all my iron, how much product could I make? And then say, if I use up all my oxygen, how much product could I make? Whichever number is lower is the real theoretical yield. That's the one that's telling you what the limiting reactant is. If I have enough patties to make 50 hamburgers and I have enough buns to make 75 hamburgers, patties is the limiting reactant because I'm running out of that. I have. I can make fewer hamburgers with the patties I have. Right? And so the way we'd show the work for that would be if we started with the oxygen, say one mole O2 for every three moles O2, make two moles product, iron three oxide. So if I used up all of the oxygen, I can make 0 0.67 moles product. And we're just going to do the exact same thing with the iron. All right. On the other hand, if I used up all of my iron, how much product could I make? And we, when we do the math, we'd see we can make one mole of Fe2O3. So by comparing those two numbers, whichever number is smaller is the real answer. Whichever number is smaller, it tells you what the limiting reactant is. Right? So because that's whatever is you're running out of first is going to make the least product. Right? And I know I keep harping on this and kind of seems like I'm going in circles. I just want to say it as many ways as possible because it really is about um, sort of understanding the logic of um, when I run out of something that's controlling how much product I can make. If I'm running out of oxygen first, it doesn't matter how much iron I have. I can only make 0.67 moles of iron free oxide. OK, and so that's two different ways to calculate and think about limiting reactant. Um, and again, they should always be they will always be consistent with each other. No matter which of those three calculations you chose to use to figure out your limiting reactant, if you did it right, they will always give you the same answer. If we want to know how much excess reactant is left over after the reaction, so that's telling us if we think about it from a food prep standpoint, again, hamburgers is my go-to analogy because everybody's been to a barbecue, right? And you're always going to run out of either burgers or patties first. And what excess reactant is what didn't you use of the 
of the other reactant. So we already figured out that oxygen was our limiting reactant here. So if we want to know the excess reactant, we look at how much iron we start with, the two moles, and then we look at how much got used. So we already did that calculation, but just to show it again, if we use up all of our oxygen and every three moles of O2 is four moles of iron used, moles of oxygen cancels moles of oxygen, we get 1.3 moles of iron used. If that's how much we used, and this, this is the part where <clears throat> I can't really teach you just one process to memorize for these. It's way more helpful to think about it in terms of what's actually happening. If I'm using 1.3 moles <clears throat> of iron and I have two moles of iron initially, the excess the stuff that's not used is just what's left over. If I have 75 hamburger buns and I use 50 of them, the excess is the difference, is what I started with minus my uh, what I use. <clears throat> so if we want to know our excess, you'd say that we would have 2.0 moles of iron minus 1.3 moles iron used. So 0 0.7 moles iron left or excess. Right, that's all excess reactant is, is what's left over. Right? And so whatever your limiting reactant is, you're never going to have any excess of your limiting reactant. We're always, for this class, we're always going to assume that we use up all of our ox or all of our limiting reactant. So if we started with one mole of oxygen and we used one mole of oxygen, there is no excess oxygen. So excess reactant is always going to be of the compound that's not your limiting reactant, which makes sense, right? You don't have any leftover hamburger patties if you use up all your hamburger patties. We also already did the calculation necessary to show this, the maximum possible amount of product if we use all of our limiting reactant is called the theoretical yield. So if we already showed that oxygens are our limiting reactants, to find the theoretical yield, we just say, okay, I use up all my oxygen, how much product can I make? So we use our same conversions, three moles of oxygen, two moles of Fe2O3, And so that's, that's the amount, they call it the theoretical yield, because this would be the amount of product we could make if everything went perfectly. It's the maximum possible amount of product. Because once we run out of oxygen, we can't keep going. So if everything went perfectly, we used every single molecule of oxygen and turned every single molecule of oxygen into product, this is how much product we could make. So that's our theoretical yield. And the last of these concepts is percent yield. That's one we've done fewest examples of so far. Percent yield is always going to be what you actually get divided by what you are supposed to get. So actual yield 
what you actually made, what you measured at the end of the reaction. We're going to divide that by theoretical, which is the most we should make. We should only be able to make 0 0.67 moles product. So if we actually measure 0 0.5 moles of product, our percent yield is our actual divided by our theoretical and then times 100 to make it a percentage. Which I think that's going to get, what, 83%? Five six, whatever five six is. No, it's not. Can't be five six. You tune that into fractions, but no, seventy five percent. Yeah, that's the fraction it was supposed to be. All right, so the equation for percent yield is on your conversion sheet, on your equation sheet. Um, so you can always remember actual divided by theoretical. And again, the theoretical is always going to be the amount that you predict. Actual is always going to be something you have to measure or I have to tell you. So again, going back to our, our barbecue example, if you had enough patties for for 50 hamburgers, but then somehow when you actually wind up forming the patties and grilling, you only wind up making 45 hamburgers. Your percent yield would be the 45 that you actually made divided by the 50 that was supposed to be possible times 100. All right, and so the these four ideas limiting reactant, excess reactant, theoretical yield, and percent yield are, when you put them all together, that's gonna be what we spend the bulk of our time moving forward on is going to be, how do we get to a theoretical yield or how do we get to limiting reactant? And so all we're going to keep doing is, it's, and they're all pretty simple mathematically if you're in moles. So a big chunk of the rest of this class is how do I get to how many moles of something do I have? And balancing reactions. Right, so if you don't start in moles, then you just either have to use a concentration to get to moles, or you have to use a molecular weight to get to moles. So let's practice using molecular weight. And I'm actually going to add some sig figs in here for the sake of rounding. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to try this one. Find your limiting reactant. So, um, double check that it's balanced. Usually, if, you, if there's a coefficient anywhere, it's probably balanced, but double check it's balanced. And you want to find limiting reactant, excess reactant. And again, I, I mentioned reagent and reactant mean the same thing. Be consistent, I'll do that. Theoretical yield and percent yield. And a, just as a hint, the first thing you should be doing for any of these problems is put everything in moles. Once you get everything in moles, all the rest of your calculations are going to be really pretty straightforward. All right, so I'll give you a couple minutes to work on that, and then we'll work through it. <laughs> 
All right, so as we're going to start working through this, we can start by, as I mentioned, putting everything in, <clears throat> excuse me, putting everything in bowls. And to do that, if we're starting with masses of all of these, we can just, we can put them into moles just by, sorry, let me zoom in on the um, whiteboard there. So you can read it, hopefully. We're just going to use the periodic table. If we have masses of our molecules, all we have to do is use the molecular weights from the periodic table. So molecular weight of fluorine is 18, uh, what was it? 18.998. Um, and it's F2 that we're talking about. So we need two of those. So our molecular weight is 37.996. So if we have 1.6 grams of fluorine, and every time we got 37.996 grams, that would be one mole. So we have well under a mole, 1.62 over 37.996 is 0 0.0426 moles of fluorine. And we do same for titanium. It's zero point zero five oh one. Right, so this, that's where we're going to start with this. Once we do that, um, the way that I, I like to organize things is just underneath the mass for each of these, I just write the number of moles right underneath it. So 0 0.0426, it helps if you get the right moles with the right compound. Zero point zero five oh one moles, and I didn't I didn't show the conversion to get to moles of <clears throat> of titanium four fluoride, uh, but it's going to be the same same process. get 0 0.028 moles of product, 0 0.284. All right, so this just get is just getting us all, everything into units we can work with. Now that everything's in moles, we can just do our stoichiometry steps. We can just use the process of using the coefficients to figure out what is our limiting reactant and what is our theoretical yield. Hmm. Um, and just looking at these coefficients, we can actually once you get the hang of it, you can eyeball these pretty well. We have pretty much pretty close to the same number of moles of fluorine and titanium, but we're using the fluorine twice as fast. So if we're using the fluorine up twice as fast, you can just look at this and say that this is going to be our limiting reactant, but we should still show it. <clears throat> so we can take each of these and predict how much product we should make. And whichever number it comes out smallest is going to be our actual theoretical yield. We can answer two questions at the same time. Say, so, okay, if I use up all my titanium and every one mole 
titanium is one mole of product. I think we can all do that math in our head, right? We're just multiplying by one. And then we're going to compare that to the amount of product we could get if we used up all of our fluorine. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio here. It's for every two moles of fluorine, one mole of product. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have two different amounts here for how much product we could make. They can't both be true. Right? Because we're using these two things up at the same time. So whichever of these two numbers is lower is our actual theoretical yield. Because this is saying, this bottom number is saying, if I used all of my fluorine up, here's how much product I could get. So because that's a smaller number, that tells us that fluorine is running out first. So we can answer our question of limiting reactant. And we can answer our question of theoretical yield at the same time. Right? We can't make all of this. We have enough titanium to make 0.05 moles of the product, but we run out of fluorine once we get to 0.02 moles. And so this has the lower number out of these has to be the real number, has to be the real theoretical yield. All right, so let me pull up the question. So that tells us our limiting reactant and our theoretical yield. We've answered those two parts of this question. I see there's a question in the chat. The last one, yes, I just combined the molecular mass of titanium and four fluorines. So four times the mass of fluorine plus the mass of titanium to get the molecular weight of the titanium four fluoride. All right, so I'm going to go back to the sharing screen for a second. And we're going to fill in the questions we've already, we just answered. Limiting reactant, we just filled that in. Our limiting reactant is the fluorine. Our excess, or our theoretical yield is 0 0.0213. So we're, we're, we've answered half of these questions and the others are just, um, we need to, to figure out the excess reactant. That's just another side of the same coin, right? So it's gonna be very similar calculations to what we just did here. So I'm gonna clear off the whiteboard and we'll answer the excess reactant question and then we'll do theoretical yield. Any questions so far? If we want to know the excess reactant, that's just we're just going to flip this same calculation around a little bit. Because we can still say, I'm going to use all of my fluorine. But now instead of comparing fluorine to moles of product, we're going to compare fluorine to moles of, of titanium. So it's still going to be so two moles 
of fluorine is one mole titanium used. And we'll get 0 0.0213 moles titanium used. So if we want to know how much we have left over, all we have to do is compare how much we used to how much we started with. So our excess reactant is just going to be 0.0501 moles of titanium minus the amount that we use, 0 0.213. Moles of titanium okay, and then just a matter of plugging that in get what two eight is that right yeah that looks right Moles titanium left. Zero two eight eight moles inium left or excess. Which also does get abbreviated as just the letters X and S. <clears throat> So last but not least, if we want to know the percent yield, let me move this out of the way and we'll just, this last one is a pretty short calculation. So we'll just do it on the slides here. If we want to know the percent yield, we're just going to take the theoretical yield And compare it to what we actually measured, which is that 0 0.0284. So percent yield. Zero point zero two eight four moles. So it's always actual over the expected. Zero two one three moles expected times one hundred percent actually can we actually in this case. get a percent yield that's over 100. Hmm. Is that possible? Can you have a percent yield over 100? In yes and no. We could measure that. If we were actually in a lab, there are a lot of ways for reactions to go wrong in a way that when we measure our product, it looks like we have more than 100% yield. It's not technically possible to get over 100% yield uh, because that'd be violating conservation of mass. It would look like we're ending up with more mass than what we started with. But practically speaking, in lab, there's a lot of ways you could you could mess up your reaction. You know, it could be something as simple as you didn't wait for your product to dry all the way before you weighed your product. 
So, in, so maybe this 3.52 grams is actually partly made up that, of that mass is made of water. That would throw things off, right? That would make your mass look bigger than it will actually was. And so you can, you can absolutely measure something as more than 100% yield, even though technically it's not possible um, to actually get more than 100% yield. Um, one of the other things that can happen is if you made other byproducts. Like, so we're running out of fluorine, but what if, if we're doing this reaction in an environment that has oxygen, we could also be making small amounts of TiO2 at the same time, just by reacting with the oxygen in the air. Well, so that means our 3.52 grams is not just titanium for fluoride, it's also titanium for oxide mixed in there. So um, just because you get your percentage, your percent yield is over 100, does not mean that you did the calculation wrong. It means that something might've gone wrong with the lab, but that's not necessarily saying that you did anything wrong in your calculation. It's always actual divided by expected. The 0 0.0284, that was, and I see that you, you found it, Katie, but just to reiterate for everybody else, that 0 0.0284 moles that we plugged in here was our actual yield. So our actual yield turned into moles using the molecular weight gave us 0 0.0284 moles. And so that's our actual, and then our expected was from our hmm, uh, stoichiometry calculations. All right, questions on this, on any of the calculations on this part? I'm trying to run that fine line between going slow enough that, that we're all keeping up. If I'm doing this right, then it should seem relatively boring and straightforward when I'm doing it, um, even if it's tricky to remember all the individual steps when you're doing it. So remember, think about what the terms mean what a limiting reactant, excess reactant, theoretical yield, think about what they mean and then go for and figure out um, what combination of coefficients you're going to use in your stoichiometry step to get there. Let's do one more. I'm not gonna go through this one in as much detail. You guys get through this, go through this and get your answers. I'll fill in answers. And actually, let's tie this into our break. I'll give you guys um, five minutes to work on this and a 10 minute break. Maybe, maybe five minutes is not quite enough time to actually let you get all the way through it. So we'll do 10 minutes and 10 minutes of break. So let's come back at 2.30 and we'll go through this and we'll check your answers on that. Sound good? Can I, just, can I just ask real, is that actual yield of both the products? So good question. No, that is the actual yield just of the silver. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Thank you.
All right. Let's go through this one. I'm just cleaning up my writing a little bit. Um, so if we start by putting everything into into moles, <clears throat> actually start by double checking that the reactions balance. This one I didn't give you a balanced reaction. So we look at it. <clears throat> Notice that on the right hand side, you before it was balanced, you only had one silver, and on the left hand side there were two silvers. It's a pretty easy one to balance. The only thing that's not balanced is the silver. So just put a two on the right hand side. Um, when you do your molecular weight conversions, you get some numbers that are all pretty close together. So 0 0.011 moles of zinc, 0 0.0119 moles of silver oxide, and 0 0.0132 moles of product um, as the actual yield. Um, once you get to understanding the, the logic behind these, if it's if everything is present in a one-to-one -one ratio on the reactant side, it's really easy to see um, what's going to run out first. If everything has a coefficient of one on the reactant side, that means everything's being used up at the same rate. In other words, one bun for one patty, right? So all you have to do to decide what's going to run out first is whatever you have less of, as long as your coefficients are all one. Um, so that made figuring out the limiting reactant pretty easily. We have less zinc. So that's our limiting reactant. And we can use that to figure out our excess reactant. If we use up all of our zinc, we use up 0 0.011 moles of zinc. Uh, silver oxide, so we do the subtraction and then round to the right decimal place and we get 0 0.001 moles of silver oxide in excess. Hmm. And our theoretical yield, again, we take our limiting reactant, everything is based around our limiting reactant, right? Because that's what's controlling how far the reaction can go. And we get a theoretical yield of 0 0.022 moles of silver. So our percent yield, then we take our actual yield and put that on the top of, of our fraction and our theoretical yield goes on the bottom. So as moles expected, moles theoretical, you were keeping track of thing of um, moles of what? Um, hmm. And so that's what's going to give us our theoretical yields. If you take 0 0.0132 and divide by 0 0.022, you get um, 0 0.6. So multiply by 100, you get 60%. And we'll keep two sig figs on it because we had two sig figs on our theoretical yield. All right, so Can percent yield is, oh, sorry, theoretical yields. Um, sorry, and somebody else was asked. Katie, did you have a question? Yeah, um, so when you do like the equations to figure out the limiting reactant, um, the lower number, will that always be the theoretical yield too? If you, if you put it in terms of moles of product, yes. So if we started by, and that'll answer your question too, David. Um, if we start say, okay, I'm going to use up all my zinc. And figure out how many, if I used up all my zinc, about one mole of zinc is two moles of silver. we would just get 0 0.022 moles of silver. And if we did the same thing with the silver oxide, and I'll clear a little bit of space, we'll do it over on the left-hand side in blue. 
if we use up all of our silver oxide, 0, 1, 1, 9, That's also a one to two ratio. That would give us a, a theoretical yield of point zero two three eight. So if we have enough zinc to make 0 0.022 moles of product, but we have enough silver oxide to make 0 0.0238 moles of silver, the lower number is the real theoretical yield. All right, so, and that's the one that we would wind up writing down right there. All right, once we get everything, once we have the balanced reaction and we have everything in moles, all of our conversions are going to be the really simple seeming whole number ratios of reactant one to reactant two or reactant one to product. Um, the math is all pretty straightforward once you get to moles, right? It's always going to be those whole number ratios from the balance reaction. It's just a, a matter about, of knowing. About, Go ahead. Sorry about the excess. Mm -hmm. So is this because it's just one to one and your only, your excess is always going to be whatever your lowest is. That's the amount of excess also. I don't right, know why. Can I was Go ahead. As we can show the work the same way. Let me stop the screen share here. Yeah, for sure. But um, I just got confused when I was doing it one to one. I'm like, this can't be right because it's over one to one. It's not changing. Right. But that that is right though, right? Okay. Let's go back to our our hamburger analogy, um, or even go go back to cars. So we're not using the same analogy every time. Every time, if it takes one frame and one engine, you're using your frames and your engines up at the same rate, right? Sure. Yeah. So, and, and then it, it would, if we're showing it, so 0 0.011 moles of zinc. If I want to know how much silver oxide that uses, I can write one mole zinc and one mole of silver oxide. But mathematically, that cancels our units out. But mathematically, nothing changes. And then is that an error on your slide? Is it supposed to be excess uh, reactant or is it actually excess re reagent? Same thing. Um, they mean the same thing in okay. chemistry. Reagent is the old way of, of saying it. Um, I just still slip okay. up and write that sometimes. On it. Thank you. All right, PowerPoint's doing this weird thing where I can't see my mouse when it's on top of the slides or the PowerPoint window. So we'll see if that continues to be a problem. Go back to screen share. Any other questions on this problem at this point? All my notes are gone now, but um, they're on the recording and we could go back through and rewrite them for any of these that you needed, that you wanted to write or through. Um, David, did that answer your question about theoretical yield in, in enough depth? All right, so things can get a little bit more complicated, um, but only in the sense that occasionally you have to go through extra conversions to get to moles. 
once you get to moles, everything's the same every time. It's just a matter of paying attention to is something being used up or produced. Um, if I give you something like, so this is um, ethanol, drinking alcohol. If I, a lot of times with liquids, it's more convenient if they're liquid to measure them in a volume. We don't typically, if you're making a, making a drink, you don't usually um, weigh out how much of every component, right? Usually for making a drink, we're doing it by volumes. Um, if you're measuring things out by volume, then that just adds one extra step to get to your moles. Because if we have a volume and a density, we can get to grams, right? Like we practiced a while ago. And if we have grams, then we can use the molecular weight to get to moles. And that's about as complicated as these get, is I can make it harder to get to moles by making you go through more steps. But once you get to moles, then it's all pretty much the same every time. Balance your reaction, get everything to moles, figure out, you know, answer the question, in this case, how many moles of oxygen or how, what's the theoretical yield in grams? So let's do that one real quick. Won't take us long. And then we'll get into talking about um, solutions. Hey, Sean, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm not really good with identifying the reactions, but would this be a combustion reaction? You're yeah. absolutely right. OK, yeah. cool. And also interesting side note that makes combustion reactions more um, relevant. Um, that's also the same net reaction that your body does when it digests anything carbon based. Um, so you can write out a combustion reaction of glucose reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water, and that's the same net result as what your body does when it breaks down glucose, or in this case, ethanol. Uh, it just does it over a bunch of steps to make ATP along the way. I believe all we'd have to do to balance this is remember that our ethanol has an oxygen in it, and that makes balancing the oxygens a little bit trickier. But I believe if we do two carbon dioxides and three waters, that gives us a total of, of seven oxygens on the right. So we need seven oxygens on the left, one of which comes from the ethanol, and the other six can come from the O2. So if, I, and again, good first step for any of these is take your starting information and convert it to moles. So this is saying, <coughs> excuse me, this is saying we have 45 milliliters of ethanol and we have a density for ethanol. And that's going to allow us to get to grams. We're starting in a volume, but then we're going to convert that to a gram to grams, and then we can go grams to moles. So if we start 45 milliliters and every one milliliter is 0 0.79 grams. get 35.6 grams. And now we can use the molecular weight. So two times mass of carbon plus six times mass of hydrogen plus one times the mass of oxygen, get a molecular weight of 46.549. is one mole. 
of C two H six O. So I'm calculating that as zero point seven six five moles of ethanol. Right, so just added one step to the front of our of our equation, not of our math conversion. And this is why we spend so much time looking at density as a conversion at the beginning. As it turns out in chemistry, density is actually a really useful conversion because sometimes it's a lot easier to measure a volume than a mass. If you can measure a volume and you have a density, you can get to mass. So if we want to know what's the theoretical yield of CO2 in grams, we're just going to get to theoretical yield in moles first. Um, and if you're not given an amount for, for both of the reactants, you can assume that the reactant that you don't know anything about, that you have enough of it, that you have it in excess. So sometimes if I'm being really careful, I'll write it. Just instead of giving you an amount of oxygen, I'll, I'll just say excess oxygen. <clears throat> And that's just telling you what the limiting reactant is. It's telling you that the ethanol is the limiting reactant. So if we know that we have excess oxygen, then all that matters is moles of ethanol, right? It's not a great slogan for life, but that is true in this particular problem. For every one mole ethanol is two moles CO2. That would give us a theoretical yield in moles. We get one point five three. Moles of CO2. And then we can take that, <clears throat> do moles to grams. We're just going back the other way with our uh, molecular weight now. One mole CO2, so 0 0.011 plus two times 15.999. Molecular weight of CO2 is going to be 44.009. One mole of CO2 is 44.009 grams. So if I fill in our number, And plug it in the calculator, we get 67.337, or 33 keeps repeating. We're only going to three sig figs, right? So 67.3 grams CO2. Right, so there's a lot of different ways I can ask these questions. But the general process is always the same. And if you watch your units and remember how you can go from mass to moles and vice versa, um, then it's always going to, it should start seeming pretty repetitive pretty quickly, which is a good thing, right? In terms of taking, taking a test, hopefully 
a test is really boring because you knew exactly what you were doing and exactly what to do on each problem, right? So that's the idea is that we get you so comfortable with these that you're seeing stoichiometry problems in your sleep um, because about 30, 30 or 40% of the final exam will be stoichiometry problems. There'll be really simple ones where I give you moles and all you have to do is balance and go from moles to moles. And then there'll be a little bit trickier ones, but it's a huge chunk of the, of the final exam. So you wanna be really comfortable with these and we'll keep practicing these. So you've seen about every way I can ask a question by the time you get to the final. <clears throat> questions on this one so far? All right, we'll save this one for the beginning of class. I thought I actually got rid of this one. Um, we haven't dealt too much with concentration in depth yet since you guys had that, um, I guess that was only last week's lab where you were talking about concentration, right? Molarity. Um, molarity is just one more way that we have of getting to a number of moles. So instead of, if you have a solution, instead of using molecular weight to get to moles of your reactant, you're going to be using a concentration and a volume to get to moles. Um, so we will practice with this one at the beginning of class on Monday now. Um, or anybody who wants to work through this one and get some practice with concentrations, we can do that at the beginning of lab after um, class today. <clears throat> Are we having class on Monday? It is Memorial Day. That's right. No, um, <laughs> we will not be having class. So we'll be a whole week before we see this one again. Um, so it would be a good one to do, you know, for some practice, maybe over, over the weekend. Um, hmm always throws my syllabi um, a loop when I when we switch over a week for uh, Memorial Day. It's always the last Monday of, of May, right? Which happens to be May 31st this, this uh, year, um, which means my syllabi were all wrong from last year. Hmm. All right. Can you we're please go back to that, conceptual. Sean, real yeah. quick? So I'm just writing it out still. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and while you guys are writing it, that we're going to talk about some conceptual stuff now and how we can look at um, precipitation reactions and um, get you to where you could actually write the products yourself for precipitation reactions. They're not redox reactions. They're pretty straightforward once we know a couple rules for them. So we're going to learn those today in the next half hour. Um, and if you do want to, these this is on the slides that are posted as well. So um, if you're still writing things down, you can always go check there um, or watch the video and pause it when you get here. Um, we we good going forward? Got enough of it written down? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm done. No worries. All right, so we're going to actually talk about some terms that you guys have heard in everyday life, probably. Um, at least if you've watched Idiocracy, then you know about electrolytes. Electrolytes are what plants crave, right? Um, electrolytes is what, what happens when you dissolve a ionic compound in water, is it turns out what you're actually doing, you're your ionic compounds are held into a crystalline state because you have all these positive charges that are attracted to negative charges. But if you can replace those with other favorable interactions, like the interactions between um, a polar water molecule, if you, have, if you have a sodium ion dissolved in water, you're basically surrounding that sodium ion with a whole bunch of water molecules where all of the water molecules are pointing the oxygen towards this sodium, because the oxygen is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So think back to polar compounds, the oxygen has a partial negative, right? 
So if you, when you actually dissolve ionic compounds in water, you actually wind up making this sort of complex where you have all these partial charges surrounding your ions. And it winds up making a really favorable interaction because you can basically, it's more stable to have all of these waters surrounding these um, ions than it is to have the ions stuck in that crystal structure. Um, and so that's what, it, what an electrolyte is. An electrolyte is an ionic compound that when you dissolve it in water, it splits up into its ions. And chloride would have something that looked really similar to this, except for the chloride, it's going to be a bunch of the partial positives surrounding the chloride. Um, and so this is actually the um, why water is conductive to electricity. Actually, turns out pure water is actually does not conduct electricity well. And that's actually where the term electrolyte comes from, is if you don't have electrolytes in water, it doesn't conduct electricity. Um, and so it took them a while to figure out exactly what was happening with that. Um, it turns out if you have these ions dissolved in water, that allows electrical current to pass through it. Um, and um, any ionic compound that you dissolve in water will make electrolytes. If it's soluble in water, then, then what's happening is you're splitting it up into these ions. Um, and that, so we can, we can write that um, as a chemical reaction. This would be the chemical reaction of actually dissolving salt in water. You start with sodium chloride as a solid, and then it turns into sodium ions that are aqueous and chloride ions that are aqueous. Um, and then you could, there's another way we can write it too, though. We can also say this by just saying solid sodium chloride turns into aqueous sodium chloride. An ionic compound that is aqueous, what it really means is that you have it in, as these separate charges floating around, stabilized by water molecules. Um, however, not everything can split up as 100% of the way. Um, there are some compounds that are considered weak electrolytes. And so in chemistry, the difference between strong and weak um, has nothing to do with the actual conductivity. It actually, or even the concentration, if it's a strong electrolyte, when you dissolve it in water, it splits up into its ions 100% of the time. And if it's a weak electrolyte, it splits up into its ions maybe 5% of the time, maybe even less. So an example of a hmm, weak electrolyte would be something like Sean? vinegar. Gina? Uh I'm sorry, but you wouldn't mention at all that there's H2O involved. Is it just because you say aqueous that it lends yeah, to the fact that's exactly that you can... right. Okay. Yeah, so the, the water plays a role in that it, it stabilizes those ions by surrounding it, but the water, we're not actually changing any of the water's characteristics as a molecule. So the water is not actually changing form at all. Um, so we would usually just write this as, I mean, if we really wanted to be complete, we could say H2O plus um, NaCl salt, but we're still going to have that H2O as a liquid, right? And so if we have it, if it's present both as, a, as the reactant and the product, it's not really changing. And so if it's the same on both sides, we don't need to write it. It's the same, just like in, in algebra, if you had plus x on both sides of an equation, you could just subtract x from both sides of the equation and it disappears. It's like it wasn't even there, right? Uh, the, net res the net equation, meaning only things that are changing, just looks like this. Hmm. Um, Anything that dissolves at all in water, any ionic compound that dissolves at all in water is, they're pretty much all going to be strong electrolytes. Whatever is dissolved 
will split up into these ions. But there are some compounds like vinegar, for instance, which is acetic acid, so hydrogen with an acetate. If you take pure acetic acid and you put it in water, it'll form ions. that are aqueous, but um, it doesn't split up all the way. It's what's considered a weak electrolyte. And, and again, in chemistry, weak just means not 100% of the time. You can have vinegar that has more ions in it than salt water, but it would still be, con and that would make it more conductive than the salt water. But the fact that not all of the um, vinegar molecules, not all of the acetic acid molecules split up means it still would be considered a weak electrolyte. Um, just so you're familiar, and we're not gonna do anything with in this class with calculations for weak electrolytes or weak acids because um, that gets into equilibrium and that's a, a whole, uh, it's a, like a whole quarter of Gen Chem is dealing with equilibrium. So if you're taking Gen Chem, we'll get into how we can calculate that in the future. But for now, we're going to be dealing mostly with strong electrolytes, which is going to be anything that's ionic that dissolves in water. Um, what happens if you keep adding salt? You add salt to water, it splits up into these ions. What happens when you keep adding salt? keeps dissolving to a point, right? Eventually you get a point where it won't dissolve anymore, right? So we could keep doing this process. Sodium chloride is a solid, goes to sodium ions, aqueous, plus chloride, aqueous. But at some point, you wind up with, with it becoming saturated. And a saturated solution just means that you can't dissolve anymore. If you, can, if you add more salt, then it won't dissolve anymore. And really it does dissolve, but what happens is when you get enough sodium ions and chloride ions in there, you can actually have the reaction happening backward too. If a sodium ion bumps into a chloride ion, it can turn back into a solid. So you actually wind up, when you get a saturated solution, what's really happening is, is it's dissolving and undissolving at the same rate. Um, and so that's an example of an equilibrium process. It's called what, what we call a dynamic equilibrium, where the reaction is happening just as fast forward as it is backward, so the net result looks like nothing's changing. Um, and so every ionic compound actually has a saturation point in water. Salt dissolves really well. Sugar is, is a covalent compound, but it still dissolves really well in water. But eventually, anything gets to a point where you can't dissolve any more of it in water. Um, and so, but there are some ionic compounds where that saturation point is really, really, really low, where we can essentially say that it doesn't dissolve at all. Granite is a good example of this. Granite is mostly ionic compounds. It's made up of a variety of organic compounds. Um, or sorry, not organic. It's a variety of um, ionic compounds. Um, but they're all so strongly attracted to each other that they don't dissolve well in water. Um, and so for all intents and purposes, if we get to a low enough saturation point, if um, we can basically say something is insoluble in water, even though it's an ionic compound and it'll still seems like it should go through the same or similar net reaction, if it, it can be um, for all intents and purposes insoluble, where it gets to its saturation point when you've dissolved 0 0.01 grams in 10 gallons of water is the saturation point. Uh, and that, so the net result of that is that we just basically would say it's, it's insoluble in water. It doesn't dissolve in water. 
Um, and it is interesting that you can take, if you took a saturated saltwater solution and then you took a big salt crystal and put it in that solution, well, if it's saturated, then it seems like it shouldn't dissolve. That salt crystal should stay as one nice, neat crystal. It turns out what actually winds up happening, because it's not really just a one-way reaction, we actually have the reaction happening forward and backwards, you wind up with the, your big salt crystal dissolving at the same rate as your, your previously dissolved salt is coming out of the solution. So our in our hypothetical example, our big, our nice, neat salt crystal in the middle of our saturated solution would eventually turn into something like this, where it was spread all around the bottom. Even though it was saturated when we put that in there, it's an ongoing process. And that's, that's what's known as dynamic equilibrium. Um, and they use that term in, in um, environmental science as well, when you're talking about predator-prey relationships predator-prey relationships, the population of predators to prey can be at an equilibrium, but that doesn't mean that there's no predators eating prey. It just means that the, the prey is reproducing at a, the same rate that it's being eaten. Right? So that's another example of dynamic equilibrium where things are still happening, but there, it looks like there's no overall net change. Um, and we can actually measure the conductivity of these various solutions, of these electrolyte solutions to determine um, how good of an electrolyte something is, how strong of an electrolyte something is. If you have a pure, if you have pure water and you add ethanol to it, you made a solution, you still have ethanol that's aqueous. <clears throat> but it, if it's a covalent compound, when you dissolve it in water, there are no ionic bonds to break apart by the water. And so covalent compounds stay as their individual molecules when you dissolve them in water. And so that's what we consider a non-electrolyte. You can still dissolve it in water, but it doesn't give you ions, which means it won't conduct electricity. Um, if you have any soluble ionic compounds are strong electrolytes. Uh, and here's my example of acetic acid solution. So vinegar has, is a low conductivity because it's a weak electrolyte. The same amount of potassium chloride dissolved in water is a strong electrolyte. We can actually measure this if you just, if you plug a light bulb into a wall socket, except that one um, side of that circuit is open and um, to these, they call these electrodes. If, it, if the solution conducts electricity, then you can complete the circuit and the light bulb turns on. If there's no way to pass electricity from one plate to the other, um, if, in other words, if there's no conductivity in your solution, the light bulb doesn't turn on because you can't complete the circuit. And if it's weakly, if it's low conductivity, you wind up with a really faint light bulb. Um, and so, this is one of the one of the reasons they're called electrolytes is because they figured out that ionic compounds have these properties when dissolved in water, um, and that so that's why they named them electrolytes versus um, non electrolytes. Electrolytes cause water to become conductive when they're dissolved. Non electrolytes do not. Um, this is more practice with solubility. I thought I actually got rid of that um, slide. Um, so the rest of this is talking about precipitation reactions. And if you happen to make a combination of ions that does not dissolve in water, um, then that's what actually what a precipitation reaction is, is that if you happen to make any combination where the solubility in water is very, very low, when you mix two solutions together, it looks like you're, you're making, you got a solid forming out of two solutions. Um, so in particular, if you take these two compounds, um, which are potassium nitrate, no, sorry, um, lead nitrate and potassium iodide, um, are both these white crystalline 
products um, and when they're crystals and when you dissolve them in water, you get two colorless solutions. However, if you take them and then mix the two solutions together, and in a second should add that, you wind up with this yellow compound being formed, which then redissolves to some extent. But if you keep adding more, you wind up with these all these little tiny yellow crystals forming out of mixing together two colorless ionic compounds, you get this yellow insoluble um, compound. And that's that lead to iodide. That's the solid that we see right here. Um, and there are actually some predictable rules that we can follow that allow us to predict whether or not we're going to make a solid when we mix two things together. Um, and so they, they refer to these as solubility rules. And it's basically just a bunch of generalizations that allow us to say, okay, well, these compounds will make, will always be soluble in water and these compounds will not. Um, and so this is the, the page from Wikipedia. Uh, if you look up solubility rules on Wikipedia, it has this table. Um, it's pretty good. There are a couple of ways that we can arrange these um, but really what this is telling you is it's giving you enough information that you can actually complete the other side of one of these precipitation reactions. Anything that involves column one or ammonia as the, as the positive charge will always be soluble in water up to a point. Solubility is a, a spectrum. You can still get a saturated solution, but they, will dissolve, they dissolve pretty well in water. Nitrates dissolve really well in water. Acetates dissolve really well in water. Um, iodide, or all the halides, chloride, bromide, and iodide, all dissolve well in water with a few exceptions. Sulfates dissolve in water with a few exceptions. So, the way we would use these solubility rules is if we look at two, two solutions that are being mixed, we can look at what are the possible combinations that we could make. And we look to see if any of them are going to be insoluble. And that'll tell us if we're going to see a solid form or not. So in this case, if we didn't see, if we didn't have this other reaction written here, we could look at this and say, okay, well, if that led to, And I've got nitrate, and I've got potassium ions, and I have iodide. And they're all dissolved in water. If I want to know if we're going to be able to make a solid out of this, if we're going to see a precipitation reaction, we just look at all the possible ionic compounds we can make and see if one of them is insoluble in water. So in this case, we could look at it and say, okay, well, nitrates. And we look down here at our solubility rules, it says nitrates, always soluble, no exceptions. So I know that the nitrate is not going to be making any solid over the course of this reaction. Well, what about iodide? Iodides, chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble except for lead two. So that tells us if you put lead two ions with iodide ions, they stick together and they don't dissolve in the water anymore. And that allows us to say, okay, well, when this reacts, I'm going to make lead two iodide as a solid. And everything else that's still there is still going to be floating around, but it's not going to turn into the solid. So you're still going to have potassium and you're still going to have nitrates, except they're still going to be dissolved in water. So realistically, they're still just floating around as ions in the solution, but the lead and the iodide stick together to make a solid product. And so you do not need to memorize these. Open book test at the final, and even realistically in any class going forward, no 
even as a chemistry major, I don't think I ever had a chemistry class where they said, no, you need to be able to memorize the solubility rules. It's like the periodic table. You just check it when you need to. It's more about knowing how to use these tables and what they're telling you than it is needing to memorize it. So let's practice with that. Um, I should also mention this section. If no solubility or no insoluble product forms, you just write NR for no reaction. Because what you're doing is you're starting with two solutions and you're mixing them together and nothing is sticking to, to each other. So you still have all those same ions just floating around. Nothing is happening. You're not making a solid. <clears throat> so if we looked at A, we have sodium nitrate and potassium chloride. So we have sodium ions, we have potassium ions, we have nitrates, and we have chlorides. If we want to know if we could make a solid product, we just have to look at the positives and the negatives and see what possible combinations we could have. We know sodium nitrate is soluble in water because we started with that and it's already aqueous, right? So we know sodium and nitrate don't stick together. But we could look at potassium and nitrate. Or we could look down here and say, oh, look, nitrates, always soluble, no exceptions. So no matter what, the nitrate's not going to stick to anything else. So the other possible combinations are with the chloride. Again, down here, we look down here, we find chlorides. It's in the soluble column. Chlorides are soluble except for silver ions, lead two ions, copper one ions, or mercury one ions. We don't have any of those, right? So the fact that we chlorides are soluble with these exceptions, we don't have any of those. Therefore, we don't have any way we can combine these four ions in a way that makes an insoluble compound. So nothing happens. When we mix these together, nothing turns into a solid. Nothing precipitates out. Right, so for these problems, all we need to do is we need to find somewhere on these tables whatever ions we have present. And we compare the ions that we have present and see if there's some combination that is insoluble. So for B, again, we have sodium ions. We have chloride. We have, this is can, and mercury one, um, it has a plus one oxidation state, but they tend to stick together in these pairs. So mercury one gets written as HG2, two plus. Each of the mercuries has a plus one, but they stick together. Um, and I'm not gonna test you on you knowing that or not. Um, but if you if it looks weird, that's why. And then we have, Acetate, C2H3O2, negative one. So if we want to see what dissolves, we look at all these. Sodium ion, that's group one. Soluble, no except, the only exception is lithium phosphate. Well, we're talking about sodium, not lithium. So sodium ion's not doing anything. And we could look at acetate. Acetate is on here. And it's always soluble except for silver ions. We don't have any silver ions. So acetate's not doing anything. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we have these others. We have chloride. Chloride is on here in the soluble section, 
but Mercury 2 is one of its exceptions. So if we wanted to fill in the product here, we would write Mercury 2 chloride. And again, if you just wrote it as HGCl, because that seems like the lowest combination of making the ions, you wouldn't be marked down in this class. It's Mercury 2 is just an exception, a weird exception. You make Mercury 2 chloride as a solid, and then you have the rest of it still floating around. You still have sodium ions, and you still have the acetate. but it's aqueous, so it's not turning into a solid. So really, that's the product. The mercury-2 chloride is the product. Everything else is just left over because you didn't make something that turns into a solid. All right, so we'll get some more practice with these reactions as well. Alan? Sorry, do you need to uh, balance that then? So we would, we would want to write out what the reaction was and then balance. Make sure you okay. get the right formula on your products based okay. on the charges and then balance it. But yeah, after, okay. absolutely. If we're going to do any stoichiometry, we would, not, we would need it to be balanced. Hmm. Uh, I believe C is another no reaction. Ammonia is ammonium is always soluble, no exceptions. Um, sulfate is in the soluble category, and strontium is not one of its exceptions. Fluoride is soluble, except for these exceptions, and we don't have any of those. So everything that we have in C everything that we can find on our solubility rules is on the soluble column. And we don't have any combinations that would be one of the exceptions. So that would be another case of no reaction. And again, down here, nitrate. We'll learn to recognize nitrate really quickly because nitrate soluble, no exceptions. That's really nice to be able to draw a line in the sand and say, no matter what, nitrate never makes a solid precipitate. So we know that it's not going to make a solid out of the nitrate. So then we just need to check the chloride and check to see if we have exceptions. And we do. We make silver chloride. So if you mix ammonium chloride and silver nitrate, you make silver chloride as a solid, then you still have the ammonium nitrate left over in the solution. All right, so we're out of time here. Um, we'll spend more time with this and it's in the context of how much solid could you make from these two solutions. Um, and doing some stoichiometry with that too. So we could continue to practice that. Uh, and just last note is that there are lots of other ways of writing solubility tables. I kind of like um, this table. It's not quite as compact as the Wikipedia version, um, but it does basically give you a whole bunch of ions. Um, you got all your cations on the left-hand side and all your anions, sorry, all your anions on the left-hand side and all your cations across the top. And that gives you a, um, a pretty wide range of things that weren't on the Wikipedia table. And, and even this is not exhaustive, right? There are other polyatomic ions that are not on here. There are other metals that are not on here. So if we wanted to know more specifically about something that was not on either of these lists, we would go check somewhere. We'd go find a, another solubility table somewhere. Um, I'm going to try not to ask you about anything that's not on, on these solubility rules. Um, and the other reason I like this one, though, is it does bring up the point that you can have things that are slightly soluble. 
And so solubility is not a binary state. It's not either soluble or insoluble. It's really a spectrum where different, you reach your saturation point at different concentrations for different compounds. Sometimes that saturation point is so low that we can basically just say it's totally insoluble. And sometimes that saturation point is so high, we can just say it's soluble. But there's also that middle ground where it can be slightly soluble. All right, we'll end there for today. And we'll pick back up with this next Wednesday. Uh,